introduction. So today uh, um, I'm going to talk about, well, I'm going to first briefly talk about uh, the kind of work on optimization landscape that I've been doing over the years. Uh, and then um, the talk is more about uh, whether or not there is hope to apply some of these techniques uh, to optimize two-layer neural networks. Um, and this is based on joint works with uh, Rohis, Zhizhe, and Xiang, and also Renzhe and Haoyu. So these are uh, two different papers. Uh, so first, um, uh, why do we care about optimization landscape? Uh, the reason is nowadays people really use very simple optimization algorithms. People use uh, algorithms as simple as gradient descent. Um, which is nothing but you just follow the uh, negative direction of the gradient, right? Uh, and it's surprising that even such a simple algorithm works uh, on many problems. Um, of course, there is some understanding of gradient descent. We know that it converges to a stationary point uh, for a long time. Uh, or more recently, we are able to show that uh, with some of the other people here, uh, that uh, gradient descent also converges to an approximate local minimum. But uh, these probably are not enough to explain why gradient descent is so successful in practice. Uh, so in order to say that, we need to say why uh, either a stationary point or a local minimum is actually good enough for the objective functions that we are optimizing. And this has to do with what objective function you are optimizing and what is the shape of this objective function. So for convex functions, they have extremely simple optimization landscape uh, in the sense that every point that has a zero gradient uh, is always a global minimum. And uh, that basically says every stationary point is a global minimum because of this property and of course many other properties. Uh, there are many, many algorithms that optimizes uh, convex functions efficiently. Uh, of course, that includes gradient descent and many of its variants. Uh, but for non-convex functions, they are much more complicated. Then ca they can have local minimum and saddle points. So we only know that gradient descent can find a local minimum. Why can we say that that is good enough for the non-convex functions that we are trying to optimize, right? Um, so. Uh, a lot of the research on optimization landscape is trying to understand what special properties uh, make a non-convex function easy to optimize. And um, um, perhaps a, simple, a simpler question is, why do we have to deal with non-convex objectives? Why, cannot, uh, why, we, uh, why it's not so easy to rewrite objectives to make them convex, right? Um, so there are some fundamental problems when you uh, think about optimizing a complicated structure, such as a neural network. Um, the problem is uh, all of these objective functions that you are going to write, they are going to have certain symmetry. And uh, these symmetry are actually going to cause many problems of non-convexity. So, so here's a simple example. So uh, consider any problem that asks for uh, finding multiple components but the components themselves do not have a particular ordering, or we don't care about the ordering of the components. Uh, so a simple example is perhaps a clustering problem. You have a bunch of points, but you um, uh, want to find, uh, say, k centers for clusters, such that um, some objective is uh, minimized, right? Um, so in this case, the solutions for uh, the problem is uh, just k centers, and it doesn't really matter uh, what is the ordering uh, in these k centers. Uh, the, um, if I permute the solution, I will get the same solution. So if the problem has this kind of asymmetry, then uh, it's easy to see that there are going to be a lot of uh, equivalent optimal solutions. For example, suppose uh, here this is one of the optimal solutions for my problem. I have, uh, I'm looking for three centers, and here x1, x2, and x3 are three vectors representing my centers. Uh, because I do not care about the ordering of these solutions, I can just permute or simply actually rename these centers, right? So now the only difference between the right part and the left part is I have swapped the name of x2 and x3, and obviously that is the same solution. So your objective function um, 
and so any reasonable objective function you write should have the same uh, function value for these two solutions. Uh, and now, if uh, but this creates a problem if you want your objective function to also be convex, because if your objective function is convex, it means the convex combination of these two solutions must also be optimal. Uh, but the convex combination of these two solutions uh, is a strange solution, right? Because x1 stays the same, but both x2 and x3 uh, goes to their middle point. So this is like a solution that has only two clusters. And intuitively, if you have a clustering problem that requires you to have three centers for, for a good clustering, having just two centers is not going to be optimal. Uh, so the same um, argument could work uh, in many other different settings where you are looking for k-components. And that, in particular, includes the setting where you are trying to learn, uh, let's say, a two-layer neural network. And, and there, the symmetry is you can permute the neurons, and uh, it's going to be the same solution. So because of these problems, um, uh, any natural objective function you can write on this parameter space is not going to be convex. And optimization algorithm needs to break the symmetry and decide uh, which one of these two equivalent solutions do I converge to. And of course, it's just not just these two solutions. In general, if you have k components, uh, there could be k factorial different solutions. Uh, and maybe even more if you have more symmetry in your problem. Um, so having such a symmetry also creates additional problems in addition to this non-convexity. It also creates problems like saddle points. Uh, so here, for simplicity, think of my, uh, we are optimizing a smooth function with no constraints. Then, of course, uh, we want to reach the global optimum, but there could be local optimal solutions. But there could also be uh, these flat region or saddle points, uh, which are hard to illustrate in one dimension, but in two dimension, a saddle point looks like this. Uh, one uh, property of these um, uh, objective function with symmetry is that they uh, usually always have saddle points. So here's an example. So this is a function um, um, which uh, is just the summation, uh, the combination of two uh, polynomials with different degrees. Uh, of course, this uh, seems like a fairly contrived objective function, but actually similar objective functions were used for problems like uh, independent component analysis. But even ignoring that for this particular objective, uh, uh, there are some obvious symmetries because uh, I only care about the even order powers of my coordinates. So if I flip each coordinate, uh, if I flip x1 to be minus x1 or x2 to be minus x2, uh, the objective function does not change. Uh, so in this picture, it corresponds to if I flip according to this uh, uh, horizontal line or this vertical line, then the function should be the same. And because of the symmetry, we can see that there are exactly four uh, Actually, th these four points are both local and global minima for this function. Um, and um, if you connect any pair of these uh, local or global minima, then usually you will be able to find a saddle point uh, uh, along this path. Of course, it's not true that every path between these two uh, optima will give you a saddle point you have to connect them in a specific way, but there is always a way to uh, connect them and find a uh, saddle point uh, along the way. Um, OK, so uh, based on these observations, the kind of new structure that I've been working on uh, is what I will call locally optimizable functions. Uh, so for these locally optimizable functions, all the local minimum are actually all symmetric versions of the global optimal solution. And further, we, uh, we know that this already have to cause uh, some saddle points, but uh, we assume that all the saddle points are standard saddle points uh, whose Hessian has a negative eigendirection. So there are no degenerate or high order saddle points for these problems. 
so these two are actually fairly strong assumptions on the objective function. But it uh, turns out there are a large number of problems that uh, uh, we and uh, also many other researchers have proved to be uh, locally optimizable. Um, most of the successful uh, examples are in uh, the context of you are finding a low rank matrix or finding a low rank tensor. Uh, but of course, uh, one would think, okay, uh, since we are successful in these matrix and tensor problems, can we hope to do anything to neural networks? Uh, so I guess a few years ago, I was uh, naive, and uh, I was hoping that uh, standard objective functions for neural networks, maybe they are also locally optimizable, right? So that would be really nice. If they are also locally optimizable, that explains why uh, gradient descent or its variance. Uh, yeah, well, I guess by locally optimizable, I'm referring to this uh, definition that I had here. Basically, all of their local optimal solutions are global. Um, yeah, so it, if they were locally optimizable, it'd be great. We, uh, but it turns out that, uh, of course, now um, it's 2019, and I guess when I had this hope, it was more like two years ago. So uh, now we know that this is not true, right? Uh, even a sim very simple two-layer neural network um, can, uh, on a very simple input distribution, namely just Gaussian, can have very bad local minimum. Uh, so this was formally verified in this paper by uh, uh, Ohad and uh, Safran. Uh, so, uh, but uh, it was actually observed uh, earlier. Uh, we have also run some experiments that show uh, that uh, show that in practice you actually get stuck in these local optimal question. So um, there were these uh, conjectures, you know, Korobanska that somehow with real life data this doesn't happen. And uh, can you also empirically disprove? Um, well. It, it, right, so uh, yeah, so there are also these other works that says uh, that under some assumptions or conjectures, uh, all the local minimum, maybe they are not all globally optimal, but they are close to globally optimal. Um, so it really depends on the setting. For example, in the setting of this paper, which is just a um, two layer neural network where the ground truth is uh, has say, n neurons that are, uh, whose weights are orthogonal to each other. So that's one of the particularly simple example. But in this example, the bad local optima uh, that you can find in practice is actually really bad. Uh, so the objective function is much worse than um, the global optimal solution. So by feature, a simple feature uh, Yeah, so in this case, the data is generated by a simple teacher network. Yeah, so you can make different. Does it go away if you overparameterize? It does go away when you overparameterize. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, well, empirically, we don't know how to prove that. Okay, so uh, so another problem is, uh, of course, uh, we have heard a lot of uh, about this uh, during the workshop. Question. The, what about the saddle point types? Like, is that an issue, or that's a more technical? Uh, yeah, so the saddle point types are more technical. Usually, uh, of course, there are high order saddle points, but for two layer networks, they are less of a problem. Uh, they are more of a problem when you go to a deeper networks. Um, yeah, so, so the other problem that we have is, in many other cases, finding a global minimum is not always good enough, right? Uh, we have heard a lot of the talks that says you need to find, uh, you need to think about what is the trajectory of optimization and what are the implicit bias that's introduced by the optimization algorithm. So just finding any global minimum may not be good enough. Uh, I guess luckily, even though these are two problems, um, maybe well, there is still hope that these two problems do not happen simultaneously, right? So when you uh, make uh, your number of parameters small, you definitely run into this problem of having many bad local minima. But then in that case, it's actually true that if you were able to find a global minimum, uh, that would be good enough. Uh, so, uh, talk about 
Ah, uh, good, good question. Yes. So uh, the qu question was whether the uh, whether by this local minima I was uh, referring to the empirical uh, loss or the population loss, right? Uh, so, so th this result uh, is in a simple enough setting where you can actually compute the expectation because they assume the data is Gaussian. So they actually did the optimization in the population risk. Uh, so there's no problem of generalization here. Even if you have infinitely many samples, there are still very bad local uh, minimum. Uh, right, I was just saying that uh, maybe these, uh, it's still possible that these two phenomena doesn't happen simultaneously when you have a small number of parameters. Optimization is hard, but maybe finding one global minimum is good enough. Uh, when you have more parameters, uh, in extreme cases, it's easy to find a global minimum, but we don't know whether that's good enough. Uh, of course, uh, there's uh, a lot of recent progress in uh, when you over parameterize by a lot, and we know optimization is easy in very highly over parameterized regimes uh, called neural tangent kernel. Um, but the question that I'm interested in is uh, whether NTK regime is enough. Um, and can we do optimization with fewer number of parameters uh, that's required by these NTK regimes? Uh, so uh, it's safe to say that uh, I, I don't have a good answer for now, but um, in this talk, I'm going to show you two examples where uh, we can still do something when you do not have as many parameters as required by NTK. Uh, so uh, these are the two results that I'm going to talk about today. So the first result is a result where the number of parameters is, um, that I'm going to learn is exactly the same as the number of parameters in a teacher network that is used to generate the data. So I'm not over-parameterizing at all. And in this case, optimization is really difficult. We don't really know how to do it using gradient descent, but we can actually do it using other methods like Maslow moments or tensor decomposition. Uh, in the second result, I'm going to show you that uh, if you are willing to work with uh, non-standard uh, activation functions, uh, then uh, you can uh, work with um, neural networks that are much smaller than what a neural tangent kernel would require. Um, okay, so for the first result, uh, so the first result is going to show that uh, if your input distribution is symmetric, there is a polynomial time algorithm that learns a two-layer neural network. Uh, there are some more assumptions which I will get to. Uh, but first, um, why do we care about symmetric distribution? Well, uh, symmetric distribution just says for any uh, possible input x, x and minus x have the same probability density. So if I observe x, I have the same probability of observing minus x. Of course, they, uh, x and minus x can still have different labels, uh, but they just have the same probability density. Uh, the reason we uh, go to symmetric distribution is actually because of the problem that many of the pre existing results in this category where you do not over parameterize, actually assume a very simple input distribu distribution. Many of the existing work uh, assumes that your input distribution is Gaussian, but of course we know your input is never Gaussian. Uh, symmetric distribution uh, is a middle ground which is not fully general, but is at least uh, much better than Gaussian. Uh, and you can even imagine that some of your actual inputs to be symmetric, right? For example, if you think about uh, amnest, amnest have these numbers, uh, but if you think uh, black pixels are one or white pixels are minus one, then just flipping the data just gives you these digits, which uh, of course we can uh, also give them the same label or uh, a different label. Um, so just by uh, doing these augmentations, you can very easily do, uh, make sure that your input distribution is symmetric. Uh, so it is a much milder assumption than assuming your input is Gaussian because it can still allow these kind of very complicated distributions. Um, but on the other hand, this cannot be very relevant for except two layers of me because the network would just perform this operation. Right? It's just going from positive to like negative. Right? The uh, that's right. Indeed, uh, the. the Indeed, the current techniques does seem very hard to uh, generalize beyond two layers. Uh, 
because the network would just perform it. Without oh, but the, no, the, I, I don't think that is the argument because the network also doesn't have to perform this, right? I mean, you are saying that the network can perform an operation that makes your input uh, the same, but the network doesn't have to do that, right? The uh, network can also try to produce an output that's also symmetric in the second layer if you add some regularizer or... Okay, you're, you're proving Positive results? Uh, positive results. Meaning it's easy. Uh, it's easy to learn such, uh, l learn a neural network under such input distribution. No, but then, you know, all you have to do is add a layer, which allows it to have a symmetric input distribution. And if somehow it was easy then, then you go. No, no, no. These two input doesn't have to have the same labels. You, you are saying the network can. Uh, have a layer that uh, randomly flips on my input, but that then it may not have the correct label. No, what I'm saying is take any image class. Yes. And now you make sure that the network is getting both positive and negative, like positive and negative in the photographic sense. Yes. Right, and then it's a symmetric input distribution. That alone should not be enough to make property. Uh, I, I don't immediately see why, but maybe we can talk about that offline. Um, yeah, so um, as a warm up, uh, even actually learning a single neuron under the symmetric distribution is not uh, completely trivial. So let's uh, first look at uh, what happens for a single neuron network. So uh, of course, this is going to be the simplest possible neural network that you are trying to learn. You, your network is just a single neuron, think of the sigma as the railway activation. Uh, and your ob objective is you are just trying to, uh, your data is generated by a ground truth W star, and you are trying to find a W that matches the prediction of W star. Um, so the question here is whether the only local minimum is at W equals to W star question. Yes, uh, single neuron, so W is a scalar. W is a vector. X is a input data which can be high dimensional. W is a vector. A single neuron just means I have a single neuron sigma applied to W transpose X. W transpose X, the inner product of W and X is going to be a scalar. Oh, I understand. You have like a bunch of circles and then one circle. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, I should have drawn the picture, but that, that's what I mean. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, or if this is not the case, can we have an efficient algorithm that finds the W star, right? So for the single neuron case, uh, it's actually possible to do some of these plots to show that what is the optimization landscape. So this is gradient flow for a single neuron network if your input distribution is Gaussian. Of course, this picture is going to depend on your input distribution in general. Uh, even for Gaussian, it's not completely trivial, as you can see from the picture. So there are regions, uh, so, so this is where W star is. W star is at one zero in this plot. So uh, you can see that near W star, uh, things, are, uh, things are very good. Uh, we have all of these gradient, well, it might be a little bit hard to see, but um, all of these gradient actually points towards the one zero direction. So that's very good, right? So that's what we want. Gradient points to you to the correct direction. Uh, but there is something tricky happening near zero. As you can see, uh, the gradient near zero is small. It's actually not even defined for ReLU, uh, just because it has some uh, non-smoothness question. Oh, OK. Yeah. So. Uh, so near zero, uh, it's not very clear where the arrows are pointing to. So, um, and in particular, the gradient can be very small near zero. And if you have a different input distribution, it might be problematic. Uh, yeah. So, but if uh, like if sigma is monotone and smooth, then you should be able to learn this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there are definitely ways to learn a single neuron using these uh, isotonic regression kind of techniques. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just saying directly doing gradient descent, uh, there are some problems. Uh, there can be some problems. Even, even directly doing gradient descent uh, can work to some extent. Um, but it's just uh, not as clear, uh, just looking from this picture. Uh, more questions? Uh, 
Yeah, so this is a noiseless case. So this is assuming that your uh, input distribution uh, is a Gaussian and I'm taking the expectation over the Gaussian. Uh, oh, you are talking about whether the prediction has a noise. Yeah, uh, yeah well, th it, it doesn't really change the picture if you have an uh, independent noise, for example. Uh, oh, I have actually not tried to compute that. But if it's 10 H, um, is that a or is that a if it's 10 H is uh, at zero, it's a saddle point. Okay, so for symmetric distributions, there are uh, there was this previous work that can actually uh, solve the single red loop problem, and their idea is actually. Um, very simple, so I, I'm going to be able to uh, show you here. Uh, of course, their paper is not just about a single neuron, so I have restated their result for the very simple case of one neuron, and uh, I've also tried to convert it to a method of moment framework, uh, so uh, their algorithm is different, and they have, uh, um, yeah, so, so they have other results on a single convolutional filter, for example. Uh, so the crucial observation that they have is when sigma is uh, the ReLU activation and when the input distribution is symmetric, there is this nice relationship where the expectation of this is the output, right, y times x, is equal to half times the coherence matrix times w. So the reason this should be a bit surprising is because on the left-hand side, we have this activation function sigma, which is nonlinear. But on the right hand side, I have a completely linear uh, formula, right? Um, but this is actually very easy to prove, so here is the proof. So if I take two times the left hand side, I can rewrite it uh, as this intermediate form. Uh, this rewriting is because I have a symmetric input distribution. So I have just, uh, because my distribution is symmetric, if I replace x with minus x, uh, my expectation should not change. So for two copies of them, for one of the copies, I have replaced x with minus x. Uh, so then the next step uh, uses the observation that if sigma is ReLU, then sigma of z minus sigma of minus z is always equal to z. Um, and of course, this is a very special property that's only true for ReLU. Um, so because of that, uh, we actually get rid of the nonlinearity and eventually we get the right hand side. Uh, so now, once we have this crucial observation, it's easy to learn W, because in, if I want to learn W, I just want to estimate as the left hand side, which is the expectation of Y times X. I can estimate this matrix, E of X, X transpose. Then I can just simply take a matrix inverse. Um, and of course, when, once I have enough samples, these uh, estimates are going to be accurate enough, and I get my W. Okay, so, so that's what happens for one neuron. Um, but it seems very difficult to go beyond one neuron, so we actually need some additional help. So in this network, uh, we are going to look at a two-layer neural network where the first layer uh, has these ReLU activations, and the number of hidden units is going to be smaller than both the number of inputs and the number of output. So uh, this number of hidden units smaller than the number of input is a fairly standard assumption in this line of work, uh, but requiring it to have multiple output is kind of special, and, and, but we do need that for our algorithm to work. Um, and the input distribution, as I said, is going to be symmetric. Uh, we are going to further assume that these weight matrices on the two layers, uh, W is going to be the weight matrix for the first layer, A is the weight matrix for the second layer. Uh, so these are just uh, general position, well-conditioned matrices. Uh, okay, so what, uh, what can we hope to do here? So uh, the high level idea of our algorithm is we are going to try to reduce a two layer network to the single neuron case that we already know how to solve. Um, since we don't have any nonlinearity in the second layer, uh, if we, we can find a direction where U transpose A, remember A is the second layer weight matrix. If U transpose A is a basis vector, then uh, U transpose Y is U transpose times uh, this output of the neural network uh, 
And that is actually just the output of a single neuron, right? So we have basically inverted the second layer to recover the result of a hidden neuron. And if we are able to do that, then we are done, right? If I can find all of these directions, I reduce my problem into learning many single neurons, and I know how to learn a single neuron. So finding a special direction uh, allows us to reduce the problem to learning a single neuron. Uh, but of course, there's a huge problem here, because um, if I can find such a direction, of course, we are good. But I don't know this matrix A, right? If I know the matrix A, well, I can just take the inverse of A, and I can have these vectors U. But if I don't know A, how can I find these directions? Uh, so our idea is we are going to design what we call a pure neuron detector, which is a function that is equal to zero if and only if u transpose a is equal to one of the basis vectors. And we are going to try to design this function so that it doesn't need to know a. Uh, of course, that's still a bit surprising, but I'm going to show you the rough idea of how to construct that. Uh, so the goal of this pure neuron detector is given xz pairs, we want to distinguish between these two cases. So the, pure, the case of pure neuron is if z is exactly equal to sigma of w transpose x for some vector w. Uh, and the second case is if uh, z is actually a mixture or a summation of k different neurons. And of course, uh, these coefficients, uh, they have at least two non-zeros. So, so it's a mixture of at least two neurons. Uh, so our plan is going to find some equations that only hold for pure neurons. We have already seen some equations that hold for a single neuron, which we used to learn the single neuron. So we are going to try to find more of those equations. Uh, so here's the first attempt. So this was the equation that we used when we are trying to design the algorithm for learning a single neuron, right? Uh, as a corollary, if I try to cancel this vector w here, um, we can also prove that expectation of z squared uh, is equal to this expression. And this is uh, going to be always true. Uh, of course, it's, uh, this is not directly, uh, this is not very immediate, but uh, just believe me that this can be derived in a very similar way uh, as this formula. Um, so this is true whenever z is a pure neuron. Uh, so it satisfies one requirement in our pure neuron detector. Um, but the problem is this equation uh, can actually also be satisfied even if z is a mixed neuron. The problem is if I take the expectation of the left-hand side minus the right-hand side, uh, in this case, uh, instead of 0, you will get these kind of terms. Uh, the expression looks very complicated. But don't worry about the expression. What's important here is this is the sum of k-squared numbers. And I don't have control over these numbers. They, these numbers can be both positive and negative. And uh, in some extreme cases, they can certainly cancel each other. And there's no way for me to prevent that. So uh, this attempt uh, does not work. Uh, so how can we fix that problem? We fix that problem by going to a high order moment. Um, so instead of uh, considering the expectation of z squared, I'm going to consider uh, a higher order moment, which is the expectation of z squared times x. Uh, this is tensor x, but you can also think of this as a matrix, which is just equal to xx transpose. Uh, again, I can have a formula for that. Uh, again, don't worry about how you derive this formula. It's following from the same uh, basic principle as what I talked about before. So the benefit of this is now if I know that z is a mixed neuron, I can write what is the left-hand side minus right-hand side. And turns out that the difference uh, is a similar looking expression, except I have this x tensor x here. Uh, but the difference between the previous case and this case is that now these are no longer numbers. So these are actually now d squared dimensional vectors. So now on the right hand side, I have sum of roughly k squared vectors. And each of these vectors has d squared dimensions. And uh, under our assumption, d is larger than k. So d squared is larger than k squared. Uh, 
uh, so I have fewer vectors than the number of dimensions. So when the problem is in general position, these vectors are actually linearly independent. And if the vectors are linearly independent, the only way that this can be zero is if all the coefficients are zero. But if all the coefficients are zero, it must mean that only one of the CIs can be non-zero. Uh, Yeah, so, so uh, of course, I'm hiding the details here. So here, by general position, uh, we actually have lemma that shows uh, if, for example, the Ws are uh, random, then with probability one, all of these things are linearly independent. We, ha we also have stronger smooth analysis results that says uh, if you perturb the W, the smallest singular value of such a matrix is going to be bounded. Uh, yeah, but at a high level, we just want these to be linearly independent, and that is going to happen uh, with probability one if you have a random W. Uh, okay, so more precisely, our lemma is if you define the pure neuron detector in this way, then it is only it is equal to zero if and only if you transpose Y as a pure neuron, and this is something that we can compute without knowing A. Uh, so the remaining part uh, is going to be simple. Our high-level algorithm is we are first going to try to compute this function. We cannot compute it exactly, but we can estimate it. And then uh, we are going to try to solve the system of equations which set this pure neuron detector to zero. That will give me a bunch of vectors u. And for each solution of the system, I will solve the one neuron problem with samples x and u transpose y. Um, now I have learned all the intermediate neurons, and then uh, I'm basically done. Um, but a uh, uh, question? Yeah. Um, when you say solve the one neuron problem, do you mean produce an efficient algorithm for finding the minimums for that? Uh, yeah. I, well, uh, previously I've talked about if you know there's on, only a single neuron, we we have a method moment algorithm for learning the single the weight of the single neuron. Uh, yeah. Understand that algorithm. No, no, no. I, I the algorithm doesn't use. Um, oh, it's not by gradient. Uh, it's not. I, I'm not suggesting that the algorithm is using gradient descent. Oh, 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 okay. okay. Uh, the whole algorithm. Sorry. Um, this is. Uh, mm, um. I understand. You're doing optimization without gradient. Yeah. Uh, yes. So in this part, we don't have anything about gradient descent. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah. So of course, I'm hiding a lot of details here. In particular, in the second step, when I say we solve the system of equations, uh, that's easy to say. But uh, if you look at this pure neuron detector, it turns out that this function uh, is actually a quadratic function in the uh, vector u. Uh, you can see there's a squared here and there's a u times u here. So it is actually a degree two uh, polynomial uh, over u. And uh, in general, uh, of course, um, we know that if you want to solve a system of quadratic equations, that's going to be NP hard. Uh, luckily, in this case, we have enough number of equations. So we can actually handle that by linearization. By that, I just mean uh, you think of uh, ui squared and ui times uj as different linear variables. And you solve the linear system of equations first, and after that, you can solve for u. Um, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to show you how to do the linearization, uh, but this is roughly the whole algorithm. Um, so yeah, so this is the algorithm. Then we've run some simulations for the algorithm. Oh, uh, yeah, so when you uh, solve the linear equation, um, yeah, you lift it to this uh, degree two monomials. And you don't need a rank constraint because uh, you can show that uh, this, well, when you think about the system of linear equations, the solution is going to be a subspace. Uh, and the subspace is actually going to be spanned by the correct UI, UI transpose. Uh, so once you have that, you can do the usual simultaneous diagonalization trick to, to get back the U. Uh, 
uh, yeah, I, I just didn't have the slide for that. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, I mean, you can run this experiment. Uh, well, you can run this algorithm using simulations, but uh, well, it does work when you have simulations. So, so this is when your output has no noise, and uh, when you have a ten by ten matrix for both layers, uh, it works very well. Uh, when you have a larger matrix, it also works. Uh, and the number of samples is not that much larger than the number of parameters. Uh, the number of samples you need to get a reasonable error is not that much larger than um, the number of parameters. You can also add label noise, uh, and similar argument would also work. Uh, and it actually uh, uh, basically recovers the right parameters. The amount of errors you make uh, is roughly proportional to the uh, is actually roughly equal to the amount of noise that you are adding, which means it's finding the exact correct solution. And of course, during the experiment, we have also changed the input distribution. You can use a Gaussian input, but you can also use a mixture of Gaussian's input where the mixtures are symmetric. Um, so yeah, so in simulations, the um, um, algorithm works fine. Uh, the problem with these kind of approach is that they are not very robust when your model is misspecified. Uh, if your labels are not actually generated according to uh, a ground truth teacher network, uh, then the algorithm turns to be more, uh, is not very robust against that. Okay, so, uh, so next time, uh, in the remaining time, uh, I'm going to talk. Yeah. Here you have k being the number of labels. Uh, k, yeah. So here, for simplicity, I just have square matrices for both layers. And if you had like the number of labels being like root k, can you lift again and do this trick? Ah, a good question. Uh, I don't know how to do that actually. I I think if the input dimension is root k, I might be able to do that. But if the output dimension is root k, I really don't know how to do that. Because I, I'm relying on having a inversion, uh, being able to invert the second layer, and when you have root k outputs, you will not be able to invert the second layer. Yeah, so that's definitely a serious limitation here, uh, and uh, yeah, we we don't know how to get rid of that. Okay, so I'm going to talk very briefly about the second result, which is also much simpler. So this is uh, about how many neurons do you need in order to memorize the training data, right? In order to achieve a zero training loss. Uh, by the results of NTK, we know, we already know that if you have a number of neurons that is polynomial in the number of training samples, you can achieve zero training loss. But in this result, we will show that you need actually much fewer number of neurons. Okay, so. Yeah, so the basic question is how large does the network need to be in order to memorize or interpolate is another word that people use in order to interpolate the training data, right? So this nice result um, by Yun, uh, uh, Sra, and, uh, uh, and others uh, uh, shows that you actually don't need a very large neural network in order to memorize the training data. In fact, you only need a three layer, if you have n training samples, you only need a three layer network with square root n neurons on each hidden layer. Uh, and if you f this result, you mean for there to exist a point in the primary space? Yes, yes. This is, uh, I'm going to say that actually next. Um, so they actually construct a neural network with ReLU activations of this size uh, that's able to well, you you give them x y pairs, um, n of them, and they are able to construct such a neural network that uh, when you input x i outputs y i, um, and the construction is actually highly non-trivial. Um, so it's not uh, uh, it's not easy to describe. And of course, because the construction is highly non-trivial, it's also not very clear if, if you run gradient descent whether you are going to find such a solution. Um, so, but at least uh, this gives hope that uh, maybe in order to just interpolate the training data, uh, 
you don't need a very large neural network. You just need a three-layer neural network with square root and neurons on each hidden layer. And this is almost optimal if you think about it, because uh, this also says nothing about the number of inputs, uh, like the number of dimensions for the input and output. So in the extreme cases, the input has constant dimension, output has constant dimension. Then really all the parameters in this network is in the middle layer, and the number of parameters there is order n, right? You really need order n parameters in order to memorize n training data, because otherwise uh, it'd be very strange. You will probably need some very non-smooth uh, functions to do that if you want an even smaller number of parameters. Uh, uh, yeah, so just by parameter counting, this is fairly tight. Um, but what we are trying to do is we are going to uh, try to design a neural network that has a similar size uh, and can interpolate the training data, but we are going to do that using a non-standard activation functions. We are not able to do it with ReLU. Uh, so here's some simple observations. So if your data points xi and yi are in general position, and your number of data point is d plus one choose two, then you can actually fit all of, all of these data points with a quadratic function over x. Uh, so you can fit the function use, uh, the data points using the function y is equal to x transpose ax, where a is an arbitrary symmetric matrix. Uh, and this is intuitive because in a symmetric matrix of d by d, the number of unique parameters you have is exactly d plus one choose two. Uh, and uh, you can also note that a quadratic function over x can always be expressed using a two-layer neural network with d neurons uh, with a quadratic activation. So, uh, so here I'm going to define it more generally to have r neurons. So my function is going to be summation of ai wi transpose x squared and l of w uh, the loss we are going to uh, look at is going to be the squared loss, so the difference between yi and the prediction of my network. Uh, so, of course, whatever matrix I want to have, I can always find ai's and wi's such that summation of ai, wi, wi transpose is equal to my matrix. I can just simply do a singular value decomposition, and that allows me to do that. Um, so yeah, if you just want to represent the quadratic function, you just need r to be equal to d in general. Uh, in the paper, the result, one of the results that we show is if your r is just slightly larger, if your r is bigger than 2d plus 2, and if all the xi tensor xi's are linearly independent, so this is basically what I actually meant when I say xi's are in general position, uh, then all local minimum of this loss function are actually globally optimal, and all of them satisfy uh, L of W is equal to zero. So all of them uh, fits the, the training data perfectly. Um, so uh, well, similar results were kind of known by a paper by uh, Jason and uh, Simon uh, earlier. Uh, it's not exactly the same as their paper focuses on the PSD case where all the AIs are positive. Uh, you need to do something to generalize that to AIs being negative, but it's not super different. Um, so this is how you can actually fit uh, roughly D squared training data using, D neur uh, using older D neurons, right? So this is uh, one step in the right direction because here my number of neurons is roughly a square root of my number of um, uh, number of training data. Uh, but of course, this cannot go on forever because uh, no matter how many neurons I have, if I just have a two-layer network with quadratic activations, I can only fit a quadratic function. And as I said, a quadratic function only has d plus one choose two parameters. So I cannot fit more than d squared training data points. Um, so in order to fit a larger training set, uh, what we are going to do is we are going to first use a random mapping from the input to a intermediate representation. Let's call that z. Uh, 
uh, of size n. So first, uh, my input data has d dimensions. I'm going to use a random mapping to map this input to a representation z, and z will have dimension square root n. And after that, in the second, uh, right, it's yeah. If you use a random linear mapping, it's again not going to be enough. Uh, right. So in fact, we use a polynomial activation function here. So the activation function here is just the inner product to the power p, where you can choose p depending on how much data you have. Um, and uh, in the second layer, we just use the quadratic activation as before. Uh, of course, there are some technical difficulties here, uh, which I'm not going to get into. The main technical difficulty is that the second layer will only work if all of these intermediate representations satisfy zi tensor zi to be linearly independent. And furthermore, you want them to be well conditioned uh, to make sure the optimization is efficient. Um, and when the activation function is polynomial, uh, you can prove that. Uh, but um, and interestingly, if the activation function here is ReLU, uh, you actually need stronger assumptions of these input x. And we do not know how to find a good uh, condition on the input x so, so that you can use ReLU in this layer. That's right. Yeah, so uh, as I said in the previous slide, uh, we have this lemma, right? So uh, when R is large enough, and if all the inputs are linearly independent in this sense, then all local minimum of L of W are globally optimal. And, and by that, um, and in, in this case, you can also show that it does not have high order saddle points because it's a quadratic function here. Well, it's a quadratic activation here. Um, and also, there's a unique global minimum. Uh, well, all of the global minimum, there's not a unique global minimum, but all the a global optimal solution will have L of w equal to 0. And oh, that's sorry, what we if need. If R is greater than? Yeah, this is the case when R is greater than 2d plus 2. Sorry, R, is the number R is the number of neurons we use. Yeah. yeah. So, so this lemma essentially means if I optimize it using gradient descent, I will always be able to find a solution where my loss is equal to 0. And when my loss is equal to 0, that means I have uh, memorized or interpolates the uh, training data. So you want to prove a similar thing for the case of more data points? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, well, I mean, the, more, uh, the similar thing is basically if I have random mapping here, and if I fix them I, and I only train the second layer, uh, then as long as I make sure my input satisfies this well-conditioned property, uh, my previous lemma is going to show that I uh, always converge to an interpolating solution. Uh, using gradient descent. Yeah, so um, yeah, again, we've tried some experiments. So for, it turns out for MNIST, you already have more dimensions, uh, like your dimension is already larger than square root of the training data. So you can use a two-layer network. And as you can see, that the loss indeed goes to 0. And here we really try to make the loss very low. So uh, this y-axis is in the log scale. And as you can see, if you decrease the learning rate, it's uh, decreasing. Uh, and um, to look at the three-layer variant, we looked at the top 100 PCA direction for MNIST. Uh, and then 100 squared is not as large as the MNIST training set. Uh, but you, uh, using the three-layer structure, you can still fit the training loss to 0. Um, but of course, uh, this is just verifying what the theorem says. What's surprising to us is that, well, I, I guess the first point is not very surprising is that if you use a ReLU network of the same size, you can actually achieve roughly the same plot. The ReLU network also memorizes the training data, but we don't know how to show that. Um, and what's maybe a bit surprising is even if you train this quadratic network, uh, it already has some non-trivial generalization error on MNIST. Uh, yeah, so, so here we are trying, training a regression problem, right? So it's, your label is just 0, 1. The so number is 0, 1 uh, all the way to 9. One hot. And it's not one hot. It's just a number between 0 it's to 9. One dimension. 
It's a one-dimensional output. And the generalization error, the square loss is like one. Uh, so it's not very good, but it's much better than a random guess, for example. Yeah, so um, of course, um, this might have some uh, relation with implicit regularization and other things, but we don't really, I mean, we are not claiming anything about generalization here. And do you see a sharp threshold that you know, you're still above parameter counting, but a little lower than uh, what your theory suggests that things break down pretty shortly? Oh, yeah, yeah, things, um, um, well, uh, yeah, so the thing is, uh, with gradient descent, um, when, we, when we do use smaller number of parameters, uh, even though it's still uh, by parameter counting large enough, um, we definitely had cases where we get stuck, but we are also not confident to say whether that's because we didn't choose, the, whether it's actually hard or whether it's because we didn't choose the correct hyperparameters. Uh, so the optimization, uh, is easier when you have more neurons because you have more decreasing directions. When you have exact number, there might be only one decreasing direction, which might make it very slow. Yeah, so it's, uh, we, we don't, uh, we certainly got stuck with a smaller number of parameters, but we don't know whether that's uh, real. Okay, so uh, quick summary. Uh, optimization landscape alone probably cannot capture the training of neural networks, and we have learned about this uh, in, during the workshop. Uh, but uh, there might still be hope to analyze uh, optimization or finding the right parameters, uh, even when you don't have as many parameters. So for when you have exactly the correct number of parameters, uh, gradient descent is fairly hopeless, but maybe you can hope to use a different algorithm. Uh, but when you have more parameters, gradient descent might still work, but we don't know how to show that except for a quadratic activation function. Uh, there are, of course, many open problems. Um, what can we say about gradient descent that are not NTK or quadratic activations, right? Uh, in particular, uh, I've, in the experiments, we've definitely observed that ReLU networks of the same architecture uh, when you train them using SGD or Atom, uh, always memorize the training data, even when you use random labels, for example, but we don't know why. Um, and do we get anything if we can optimize these mildly over parameterized regimes, right? Do we get a better generalization bound if we can optimize a slightly smaller neural network? Um, and finally, uh, there's the other limit of making uh, neural networks infinitely wide, and that's called the mean field limit. Is there, uh, is there any connection with a not so wide neural network with uh, the mean field limit? Intuitively, the mean field limit has a L1 kind of normalization, so might, it's possible that it has some sparsity implication, but we don't know whether there is a connection. Uh, so that's all, thanks.